Hi. What we're going to do today is uh, we're generally going to introduce philosophy. Hopefully I'm going to dispel a couple of myths about what philosophy is or does or fails to do or what have you. Uh, there have been enough bad jokes about philosophers out there through the history of Western philosophy. And in fact, as long as there have been philosophers, there have been derogatory jokes about philosophers. So, um, starting right from the beginning, I'm going to see if I can't unpack a few notions about what philosophy is or does in order to start us off at a point that does not obscure the truth of things. Right? So, um, after that, uh, what I'm going to do is move to a brief discussion of two very specific pre-Socratic philosophers. Now, a pre-Socratic philosopher is just a fancy term for a philosopher who was before Socrates. Right? You might ask, what's the value in calling them pre-Socratic philosophers? Well, the answer is we actually don't know all that much about them. Right? We don't have all that much in terms of historical records from that time. Um, most of the books have been lost. Most of the libraries have been sacked that sort of thing. So um, we have only the vaguest notion of what they were actually arguing and what their positions actually were. But we have enough on these two figures that we're going to talk about today uh, to paint sort of a general picture um, in such a way that it's kind of clear that Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the whole bunch of them are kind of uh, responding to a debate between these two figures, at least by my interpretation. But nonetheless, what I'm hoping to do today is start up, start sort of a conceptual arc that will follow um, throughout the rest of the semester and um, set up a, you know, the sort of weird form of questioning uh, that the history of Western philosophy presents us with. Now, um, the history of Western philosophy starts with sort of a bizarre event. A fellow by the name of Thales was able to accurately predict an eclipse by some sort of rational or systematic method, right? And not by recourse to um, myth or the work of the gods or what have you, right? This marks a very important point in Western thought where we stop explaining the phenomena that we encounter through the course of our lives in terms of gods or myths or something, right? For, for the ancient ancients, right, there were gods in everything, right? So if something happened to you, if it rained today, if you got sacked from your job, if your dinner didn't taste very good, if there was a bad crop or something along those lines, right? then um, you would explain it in terms of, boy, I must have really pissed off some god somewhere. Likewise, if something good happened to you, it was the work of the gods, in, in, in your, activity, your life it would be favored right, by your interpretation by the gods. Right? Thales did something different. Right? He was an astronomer. Um, he was, he was um, actually a good businessman as well. Right? after he was able to predict the eclipse, the other thing that he was able to do, again, by some sort of rational systematic method, and not by appealing to the gods, was to predict an extremely large olive crop that was coming in um, the following year. Right? So what did he do? He went into town, he purchased all of the olive presses so that when the olives came in, everybody would have to come to him. So he became quite wealthy, you know. So um, it's not by any stretch of the imagination am I suggesting that uh, uh, study philosophy earn big money or anything along those lines, but nonetheless, um, using your faculty of reason can actually help you in practical ways. Now, um, philosophy, it asks of phenomena in a systematic way that they explain themselves. Right? It uses this faculty of reason that makes us, to some extent or another, and by a number of arguments, right? not my arguments, but arguments, right? distinct from just about everything else that we encounter in the natural world. We, as human beings, can ask and attempt to answer for ourselves using our own faculties the question, why? 
why is it sunny today? Why is it rainy today? Why am I taking this course, right? So that's the central question, right, that encapsulates and frames the history of Western philosophy, right? And in fact, the, the philosophy, it sort of exists in three related um, yet distinct spheres, right? And these, these, these spheres relate to particular kinds of question, right? So in the most general terms, philosophers ask three questions. What is real? Or what's the underlying nature of reality? And the field in philosophy that attempts to answer these questions we call metaphysics, actually a term coined by a philosopher we'll be taking a look at, Aristotle, right? It's literally after physics. Physics answers all of the how kind of questions, right? Whereas metaphysics is meant to get at the underlying sort of nature, right, of how things appear to us and operate the way that they do, right? Next, uh, we have epistemology, or as some programs thinking people will actually shy away from the term epistemology, ooh, it's a scary term, right? Um, ways of knowing, right? It asks questions like, how do we come to know any of the things that we claim to know? What counts as knowledge? On what basis can I make a claim to knowledge, right? And then finally, ethics, right? Ethics asks the question, what should we do? Right? So uh, philosophy is framed by basically three simple questions. What's reality? What's the underlying nature of everything that appears to us? Right? And this will answer questions like why is there something rather than nothing, that sort of thing. Right? So what's real? How do we know? And what should we do? Right? So those are the three basic questions that frame Western philosophy. Right? Now, turning to Heraclitus and Parmenides, right, they kind of grapple at, at least with the metaphysics and epistemology and what we have from them. Right? Um, we'll start with Heraclitus, even though he was born after Parmenides, I just like starting with Heraclitus. Heraclitus um, was an empiricist. Right? It, you've heard of all of the empirical sciences and that sort of thing. Basically, it, they set up a whole series of controls and watch what happens, right? And try to draw inferences and, and conclusions based on the evidence provided by what? The senses, right? So we look, we smell, we taste, we listen, we touch, right? And that evidence right, is going to be the basis for any reliable claim that we're going to be able to make about the natural world. That's what an empiricist position entails. Right? Now, Heraclitus was looking at just about everything that he could look at, right? As an empiricist, he's asking questions about, you know, the natural world and getting answers based on the reliable evidence of his senses. Right? Now, to make the philosophical leap, however, right, what he was trying to answer in terms of a question is that metaphysical question, what's the underlying nature of everything? And based on the evidence provided by his senses, well, what did he see? He saw things come into being, things pass away. He saw things that were similar to one another, but distinct from one another. This and this are the same sort of thing. But this is not this, right? So, multiplicity, right? There are many sorts of things that seem to resemble one another, right? And in a word, flux, right? The whole universe is in kind of a flux kind of situation. Things come into being, things pass away, everything changes. He's very famous for claiming that you cannot step into the same river twice. So. For example, if you go down to your local river, in my case it's the Detroit River, and stick your foot in, then take it out, and then stick your foot back in again, the second time you stick your foot in, 
not any of the particles of water that were touching your foot the first time are actually the particles of water touching your foot the second time. Right? So, it, interestingly, what Heraclitus discovered here is that language can be deceptive to some extent. Right? I point at the Detroit River, and that's the river I grew up next to. Right? That's the river I've lived by all of these long years. That's the river, believe it or not, I've swam at. Right? Believe it or not, it's, I wouldn't suggest it. Under toes, nasty water, that sort of thing. Right? But the Detroit River is not a permanent, changeless entity. Right? It's in a constant process of becoming what it is, and there will be a point further down in history where they won't, will not be a Detroit River anymore. Right? So to call these things entities Detroit River right, suggests a certain kind of permanence that Heraclitus' analysis shows us is a little off. Right? Likewise with anything else. Think of um, your university. Right? If your parents went to your university or your grandparents went to your university, or even you had an older brother or sister who went to the university before you. Right? You like to think you went to the same school, but they build buildings, they tear down buildings. Um, if it was 10 years ago, I wasn't teaching at your university, etc., etc., etc. Right? So when we use language to describe things, it, you know, it sort of implies a form of permanence that if we trust our senses, and look at the things themselves, the only constant that we find is flux. All things are in flux. Right? Now, this puts us in a sort of annoying epistemological position. Right? If everything that we ever encounter with our senses is in a constant state of flux, how is it that we can say anything reliable that can count as a bit of knowledge that I can pass on to other people, other generations, what have you. Right? If everything's in flux, then nothing we can know, it would seem at least, right? it can be reliably known. That is, implicate a past, imp implicate a future, implicate the present as well. Right? Well, Heraclitus had a bit of an answer to this, right? and it's sort of a funky answer. I like it. Right? Well, you see that the Detroit River is in a constant state of flux. You can't step into the same Detroit River twice. Right? But we can, if we're very clever, understand the change that is occurring right? in this larger movement that we call the Detroit River. It makes sort of a wacky kind of rational logical sense, if we understand it in terms of causality, if we understand it historically, if we understand it practically in terms of it being a shipping channel, or what have you. Right? We can make sense of this phenomena in a way that can implicate the past, implicate the future, and implicate the present. Right? He calls this sort of funky hybrid of reason and language logos, L-O-G-O-S. Right? So the first figure that we've just discussed is Heraclitus, and I just realized I don't have his name on a board or anything behind me here. Sorry, I don't have a chalkboard today. But um, his name is spelled H-E-R-I-C-L-I-T-U-S. Right? And just to give you a time scale, uh, both Heraclitus and the next guy, Parmenides, that we're studying were pretty close to contemporaries. They were in dialogue with one another. Right? And um, both were born in five something or rather BCE, right? So this puts it over 2,500 years ago, right? And that's a pretty good argument. It's, it's, we're not, it's, it, you know, the empiricist position is something all of our physical scientists, uh, sciences are based on, right? So pretty knockdown argument, right? And you've got to understand Heraclitus and Parmenides kind of like Stephen Hawking and Green. Right? When they get into a debate, these are the big figures of their age. Right? So that's Heraclitus. Change, multiplicity, flux, he's an empiricist, and everything makes sort of a certain kind of wacky rational sense using this sort of hybrid of reason and language that is called logos. Right? Now, 
Parmenides, on the other hand, was a rationalist. Right? And it, being a rationalist, what faculty would he trust? Right? Just, it, just as a guess, maybe the faculty of reason. Right? He denied the evidence of the senses. Right? Why would he do this? Well, you're familiar with optical illusions. The Greeks were very familiar with optical illusions. Right? So, right, it seems clear that our senses deceive us. Right? So it's, the Greek example is interesting. If, if you look at the Parthenon, right, what you find is a temple. It's it, it just about every cheesy intro to philosophy textbook has this cheesy picture of the Parthenon on it. Right? That's where the Greeks were hanging out. It's a temple built to Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, and it was meant to be representative of, excuse me, I'm going <coughs> to sneeze. Excuse me there. But it was meant to be based on an ideal of rational, mathematical perfection. Right? So all of its dimensions were very, very specific and measured by you know, techniques that are pretty amazing to us today because we're not even building buildings that are this perfect currently. We could, we just don't want to spend the money. Right? So, um, nonetheless, this temple was built, and what they did when they were putting it up is they built these perfectly straight pillars. But when they put one of them up, right, it's uh, up at the Acropolis and the Agora is down here, so the people down in the Agora would look at, up at this building, and this perfectly straight pillar would look like it's bowed in in the middle from a distance. Huh, that's an interesting optical illusion. All right, so rather than a perfectly straight pillar, what they had was something that did more like this. So to solve the problem, what the designers and the architects did is kind of wow the pillars out in the middle so that it, when you're looking at the Acropolis from down here in the Agora, you'd look up and another optical illusion would counter the initial one. So these pillars doing this would look perfectly straight rather than bent in in the middle. All right. So, the senses can deceive us, and the Greeks are very aware of this, so Parmenides, the rationalist, discounts, just dismisses the evidence of the senses and says, the way that we get to a, ra a reliable understanding right, of anything is not by looking at things, but by thinking, and thinking carefully and clearly. Right? Now, much like Heraclitus, who was trying to understand the underlying nature of everything, that question we call the question of being, big B-E-I-N-G, right? Now, Parmenides, unlike Heraclitus, who comes at it sort of sideways, asking, well, based on the evidence that I have, what is the underlying nature of everything, and the answers change, Parmenides, on the other hand, just goes straight out of the gate and asks the question, what is being? What do I mean by being? Well, he gives it a fairly simple answer. Being is simply that which is. It is, right? So, I'm a human being. I exist as a human, right? This, here it is. Smack it on the table. It's got being. It exists, right? That lamp behind me. Huh? That lamp behind me. Sorry, cameras are funny. Um, it exists, right? It has being, right? These are beings. I am a being. You're a being. This computer is a being, right? But he's not just asking about this thing or that thing. He's asking the big question, the everything question, the capital B being question. What is being? It's simply that which is. That's simple. It would have been a whole lot simpler if he had just stopped right there. Right? But he continued to think about this. Well, what's the opposite of being? Nothing. Well, what can I say using the faculty of reason about nothing? Right? If being is simply that which is, what's that which is not? Well, the only intelligible thing that we can say about nothingness is that it isn't. Close your eyes and picture nothing for a minute. I'll wait. You can't.
You can't do it, right? You can't think it, you can't reason about it, you, all, it, all you can say is that it isn't, and we've never encountered anything that isn't. The only thing we ever encounter are things that are. Being, right? So, interestingly enough, right, the, the whole statement that, that, that Parmenides issued, being is simply that which is. That which is not, cannot be, and can't even be spoken of. All right? Now, I was unprepared, I don't have an example, so why don't I just rip something that I'd, I found on the table next to me? All right? This is a piece of paper, actually. It's um, Wine County, Ontario Travel Guide, the cover of it. All right? I can say that. All right? This is a being. It has a certain kind of existence All right? as the cover of the Wine County, Ontario Travel Guide, 2012. Discover the great wineries and rest restaurants, galleries, and shops among quiet roads in Ontario's backyard. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, it's not what it was anymore, right? It's just changed. It was something, and now it's not that something anymore. Remember what I was just saying about nothing? Watch, I'll do, the, do it again. Up, oh, changed again. Right? What I was saying about nothingness just a second ago, it following Parmenides, that which is not cannot be and cannot even be spoken of. Nothingness is not rationally intelligible. We can't say anything intelligent based on the faculty of reason about nothing, except that it isn't and cannot be. But, to rip this thing up, watch, I'll do it again. Now, what do we have? One, two, three, four pieces of cardboard. This is four pieces of, you know, cover a book. Now it's not. I just use nothing again. Alright? So, in order to explain things like change, in order to explain things like mul multiplicity, this and this are similar, but this is not this. I have to use the word not, which evokes the term nothing, which is an illegal move to this particular rationalist. Right? So to explain flux, we need recourse to this completely irrational concept of nothing, which is an illegal move. So Parmenides, right? there can be no change, no multiplicity, no flux. And remember what I said, right? It's hawking on one hand, green on the other hand. These are the big heavy hitters. These are the best theorists of the day, right? They both seem to have pretty good arguments. The empiricist argument yields change, multiplicity, flux, and it makes a certain kind of rational linguistic sense. On the other hand, the rationalist answered what being was, said the only intelligible thing that you can say about nothingness, and then disproved change multiplicity flux. You have two theories by the two most notorious theorists in your era that have come to conflicting and contradictory conclusions. Can't both be right. Both have sound arguments. Both seem to be correct. So what do you do? What's going to happen? What's going on? Right. Well, the answer right, that the theorists came to was that, well, maybe we can't know. Maybe it's beyond the capacity of our human intellect to answer this question about the underlying nature of everything. Enter a group of figures in ancient Greece. Right, by the name of the sophists. Same root as the word sophisticated. Sounds pretty good, eh? And if you were a very lucky Greek citizen, which means your parents own land and aren't slaves, and if you are a very lucky Greek citizen who's also male, because women couldn't be Greek citizens, 
what your parents would do for you if you were very lucky is hire a sophist, the sophisticated person, to come and teach you all sorts of things. Right? You know, like astronomy, like any of the natural science that they had at that point, but most importantly, rhetoric, the fine art of persuasive argumentation. Right? Now, these sophists would teach anybody anything for the money. Right? One famous sophist it published a book that was circulating around the time it just, just posed Heraclitus and Parmenides. Right? It, basically telling you how to win whatever side of the law case you happen to be arguing. Right? Now keep in mind, this, this would be a big social problem for Athens, right? dedicated to the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the whole theory of justice right? that undergirds this whole society was that through argument and public debate, the truth would out. Right? So through these arguments that would happen in the courts, they would decide whether to go to war, or stay at peace, they would, etc. Et it's much like our society. People would debate, right? and the result of the debate would um, it, it come to a vote. Right? The Athenian citizens would vote and decide whether to go to war, whether to stay at peace, whether people were innocent or guilty, should be executed or not, um, what the laws were regarding commerce, whether somebody should have their land taken away or keep it, um, etc. Right? This is the whole basis for the theory of justice that undergirds the city of Athens. Right? That argument leads to what's truest or best. These sophists teach something other than that. It's not this rational form of argumentation that aims at getting at what's truest or best. It's, well, the other sense of the term argument. Right? The kind of argument I might have with my girlfriend when I want Thai and she wants Chinese. Right? I don't care what's truest or best, I want what I want. Right? I want Thai food. And I'm willing to say just about anything in order to get what I want. And so she. So we bandy about our arguments and that sort of thing. And eventually, one of us persuades the other to adopt our position. Right? Note that that's something very different than what's going on in the more philosophical sense of the argument, right? We argue, we debate with one another about the underlying nature of things, about moral matters, about the nature of justice, what counts as wisdom, etc. And the conclusion is ideally the product of a very intense rational investigation which yields the closest that we can get to truth or what's the best. So these sophists, you know, what were they doing? These aren't stupid people. These people themselves were trained in philosophy and astronomy and, you know, ethics and rhetoric, of course, and mathematics and what have you. These were, you know, the smartest people in the society. Right? And from all reports, they would do quite good. What were people buying from them? And what did the sophists think they were selling? Well, think back to Heraclitus and Parmenides. The two smartest people in Athens formulated two knockdown arguments for what is the underlying nature of reality, what's true about the world. Right? And those two arguments contradicted one another. Right? The conclusion was, well, maybe we can't know. Enter the sophists. Well, what can we do with reason and science and mathematics and argumentation and that sort of thing? Money and power was the answer. The sophists themselves made lots of money, and it was good value when you bought your son a tutor, a sophist, to come and teach them mathematics and all that good stuff. 
Why? Because then your little son could go out and argue effectively in the courts to gain money and power. Hmm? So that's a little bit corrupt and contradicts pretty fundamentally the theory of justice in ancient Athens. So it wasn't very long before <coughs> the term sophist became sort of a dirty word in Athens. And when we turn to the Apology, you'll see that one of the charges that Socrates is up against is the charge that he is a sophist, right? Somebody who makes the weaker side of the argument appear to be the stronger side of the argument. Right? In fact, on the first three pages, you get one of Socrates' accusers making an argument about how Socrates is not to be trusted. He's warned the entire jury about Socrates because, you know, he has a pretty way of speaking that obscures the truth rather than gets at it. Right? So don't be persuaded by his pretty words and, you know, you know men, uh, intellectual sleight of hand tricks. Right? Now, Socrates, it, as you'll see, is pretty clearly not a sophist, though he's kind of a jerk in the way that he argues. Right? But he's the kind of jerk I like. It's, he's the kind of jerk I would go for a beer with. Right? So, um, that will set us up for the Socrates material. Now, a couple of things that came up um, just as I was discussing this. Right? Firstly, that philosophy is decisively a turn to, you know, rational natural explanations right, for the phenomena that we encounter and a turn away from purely mythic explanations. Right? That's to some extent the case, to some extent not. But nonetheless, that's the movement that um, defines the birth point of Western philosophy. Second important thing, um, the three spheres. Metaphysics, what's the underlying nature of reality? Epistemology, or ways of knowing, uh, which which asks what how how do I come to know the truth and ethics, right? These these three fields are distinct from one another, but nonetheless act together to create the core of um, the manner of questioning that is philosophy, right? Now. Another important thing to keep in mind as we engage with philosophy is that a lot of people think that philosophy is just opinions. Right? Every semester I read in a paper, well, this person was of the opinion that, or believed that, or what have you. Right? Now, these words are not dirty words. Right? Opinion is not a dirty word. Belief is not a dirty word, and in fact, if, if we think about the whole tapestry that is truth, right, this entire wall behind me, let's, let's have that represent truth, right, how much of it do you think even the best of our science 2,500 years after these guys were arguing has managed to glean? I can tell you right now, it's about a pinprick, right? The more we know, the more we realize just how much we don't know is out there. So, without opinion, we wouldn't get too terribly far, right? Opinion's not a dirty word, right? But what philosophy does is it demands of mere belief or opinion that it show us its reasons, right? I believe X. Okay, why do you believe X? Well, I believe X is the case because of A, B, and C. Well, we can then have a conversation about A, B, and C as supporting your belief X. Right? It's called justification for true beliefs, or the JTV model, and we'll see that at work in the Apology as well. Right? So, hopefully from this, um, this, this will provide sort of a starting off point um, for our treatment of Socrates and the Credo and the Apology. Right. Well, thank you for your attention, and um, I'll give you more videos soon. All right, take care.